is in here. Brother John Haffey, can you help me pass these out, sir? Appreciate you, sir. Hopefully we'll have enough. I think we will. I think we will. Okay. Um, all right. Go in your Bibles to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9. And uh, Thomas, can you get the door for me when you're on the way out? All right, buddy. Thank you, sir. Romans chapter number 9, and we are down in verse number 6. That was where we stopped last week. Um, you're going to get a handout uh, right now from Brother John. You will not need that at this exact moment, so you can put that away just for a second. I just want you to have it right now. Uh, wishful thinking has me thinking we may get to it today. That's my goal. All right, so uh, Romans chapter 9, verse number 6, that's where we left off. Romans chapter 9, verse number 6. And uh, remember, at the beginning of the chapter, what, what we might do, we may start with uh, verse number 3. Romans chapter 9, verse number 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, those are the forefathers of Israel, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. And then in verse number 6, he, he uh, sort of switches gears here. He's still talking about Israel, but he says something that's sort of curious. In verse 6, he says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. By the way, the word of God will always have an effect somewhere. All right? It will be different in everybody's life, depending on how open they are to receiving it. Whether you're talking about a corporate group of people like Israel or a, a corporate group of people like New Heights Baptist Church or you as an individual child of God. All right, but the word of God will have effect. So that's what Paul says at the beginning of the verse. But then he says this in verse 6 at the end. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, in your uh, handout that was given to you last week, number 6, maybe it was a week prior, I don't know, number 6, and we ended with this. It says this, Paul's statement in verse number 6 does not negate the promises to the physical nation of Israel. That's important to understand. All right, that verse, verse number six, does not mean that God is completely done with Israel or that God replaces Israel with the church. We are a unique body. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on as the church, the body of Christ. All right, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, right? We are all one within the body of Christ. However, there are distinctions between all the nations versus the nation of Israel. That is still there. But what Paul is going to do in verse number 6, he's going to start making a case. Verse 6 is a turning point. Uh, the first couple of verses, he's talking about the physical nation of Israel. But then in verse number 6, he goes, hey, let me talk to you about a spiritual nation. All right? And let me remind you, folks, that that is exactly what we are in the body of Christ. Uh, look at 1 Peter chapter number 2 real quickly. 1 Peter chapter number 2. We are a spiritual nation. All right. Now, let me say this. I am very thankful to be an American. You better thank God that you're born where you're born, that you have the citizen. Let me tell you something, guys. I know some people in other countries. I know a, a number of them right now that I know personally that are wanting to immigrate here, and it is very challenging. They wish they had a passport that said U.S. citizen. You better thank God for what you have in regard. You say, well, our country's a mess. Absolutely. Let me say this. The world is a mess. All right, pick your poison. And if you're going to pick your poison, I, I, I'd, I'd pick here. I think it's a great place to live. I think it's still the greatest uh, country in the world. That said, let me say this. Your identity as a Christian is not found in America. I love the flag. I'll salute it. I stand, I'll sing the anthem. I'm all for it. My dad was in the army. I'm a patriot. I love patriotism. But let me tell you, my allegiance is not first and foremost to a fiscal nation, but to a home. My destiny is up there. Amen? Uh, look at 1 Peter chapter number 2, and look, if you would, at verse uh, number uh, 6. Where, wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Obviously, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, we talked about that last time, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. By the way, 
That disobedience there, I want you to understand, in context, that's talking about being disobedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ as you read about in Romans 1. That is someone that rejects the gospel and does not get saved. That's what that disobedience is there, all right? Uh, In context of what he's talking about, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Look at verse 9. Now, he he spent a, a bunch of verses talking about the stone, and then he talked about the builders, those were the leaders of Israel that rejected their stone, and then he goes, but ye... He says, but, he's switching gears, he goes, but you guys, but ye are what? A chosen generation. They ever thought, man, I wish I, li-, you know, I, wish I lived in the 1940s, I wish I lived, you know, in America's, uh, when America was, was a righteous nation and all that. W- w- listen, you're here right now. God put you here right now. And he says, you're a chosen generation, look at this, a royal priesthood, underline it, a holy nation. So, so spiritually speaking, we are a nation of God, all right? And you look around this room, oh my goodness, you talk about diverse. You got brown, you got white, you have black, you've got stuff in between, you got Hispanic, you got, listen, we're all over the board. You say, why? That because in Christ, it doesn't matter, amen, all right? But, but listen, as, as far as the spiritual side of things is concerned, we are called a nation. He calls us a spiritual nation. Notice what else he calls us. A peculiar people. You ever feel like you're weird and you don't fit in? That's just fine. That's how you ought to feel out in the world. When you start feeling like you fit in, something's wrong with you. When, when, you, when they start telling jokes that are off color and you know you shouldn't laugh, and it's funny, you just start giggling, and before you know it, you're joining in, and then before you know it, you're just one of the guys, and you're slapping the back, <laughs> and you fit in right with them, something's wrong. I don't think you've lost your salvation. I just think you're out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a peculiar people, but notice there he calls us a, a, a what? A holy nation. Now, let me just say this about that. That is something that Peter says to Christians today. But I want you to understand that Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. And when that was originally given, it was given to Israel. And so what God says, God is not done with them. We're going to explain all of that in chapter 11. By, by, actually, we're going to explain some of that today. But, but I want you to understand that we are a nation like Israel was. The, here's the difference. We don't have a physical priesthood. We don't have physical promises about physical land that we're going to inherit. That is why when somebody asks me, are the gifts of healing for today, I'm going to tell you No. Because your blessings and your miracles are spiritual in nature. They're not physical in nature. All right? When the king comes back and he, the king of the kingdom of heaven shows up, he, makes, he lifts the curse and takes away sickness and he brings healing to the earth. That's what he did during his earthly ministry and his apostles did it as a sign to the nation of Israel. That's why Paul says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. There are no apostles here this morning and there are no apostles alive today. That is a biblical fact. You cannot dispute that. All right? So, so what I'm getting at is this. Physical nation, they get physical promises and physical blessings. And listen, if they didn't obey God, God would say, okay, I'm not, raining, I'm, not raining, uh, uh, I'm not sending rain to your land. You have no crops. You go, well, uh, I know sometimes God judges nations. He still does that today. I understand that. That's true. That's true. But let me just say this. How do you judge the church when they're all over the world and they're not confined to one physical nation? Do you understand what I'm saying? We're, we're not waiting for physical things. We're looking for the spiritual. That's why when people get involved in the name it and claim it stuff, like, you know, you just got to name that. I I saw the funniest meme, and here's what it had. It had a picture of a bus, someone waiting for the bus, and it says January. Over here it says Jackson Hewitt, February. Over here it says, uh, it has a picture of Mercedes Benz, March. Like the person driving the Mercedes Benz that was just on the bus. And then over here it has a picture of of the Mercedes Benz getting towed away, April. (laughs) <laughs> he, said, he said, what is that? Look, we're not here to inherit physical blessings. Every once in a while, God will shower blessings on us, and thank God for that. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm talking about as a corporate group, as a corporate nation, God told Israel, if you do this, I will give you these physical things. He does not tell the church that. As a matter of fact, he tells you, do right, and you're going to suffer for my sake. <laughs> All right, who wants in on that, right? I mean, but that's, that's the difference. All right, so they're not the same, but there are some similarities. He calls us a nation. Go back to Romans 9. That's why he says in verse 6, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So let's let's do it this way. They are not all born-again children of God, which are of the physical nation of Israel. That's what he's saying. 
just by being born physically a Jew, if you reject Jesus Christ, you would suffer the same consequences that a Gentile does. All right? That doesn't mean that God is done with the nation of Israel as a nation. But as individuals born as Israelites, they have to receive Jesus Christ just like, just like the Gentiles do today. It is the gospel for all nations, including the nation of Israel. So he says, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And so I want you to be clear about this. Uh, number seven in your outline. All right, we're going to explain some of these things here in a moment. Number seven, there is a spiritual Israel. That's you. There is a spiritual Israel that is made up of born-again believers today. This is seen in the connection to the word promise and the reference to Isaac rather than just Abraham. I'll read that part again. This is seen in the connection to the word promise and the reference to Isaac rather than just Abraham. You'll find, uh, uh, let's keep reading in verse, verse number seven. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. All right. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. All right. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, there's Abraham. These are not the children of God. There's Isaac. There's the connection through Jesus Christ. All right. Guys, remember this. Remember that Isaac is a picture of Jesus Christ. Isaac is Abraham's son. All right, Abraham being the father, uh, and you know what Abraham does? He willingly takes his son up to a hill, up to the top of a mountain, just like Jesus goes on Mount Calvary, and the son does not fight the father. He does not squirm. We don't read about that in Scripture. We don't read that the son goes, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. You know what the son does? He goes, okay, pops. He lies down. And the dad uh, ties him up, and he pulls this, the knife up. Now, obviously, you know the end of the story. God says, hey, stop. Now I know you love me. But it's a picture of something. It's a picture of the, the promised seed that God said would come, that God promised to Abraham, that God promised to the nation of Israel. There's a connection to Abraham, not just Isaac physically, but spiritually through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was made of the, of the seed of David according to the flesh. He is of Abraham. And so what you have is you have a correlation between Abraham being connected with the physical nation of Israel and Isaac being connected with the spiritual children, the children of God. You say, why? Because in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Look what he says in verse number seven. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. You say, what is that? Well, that's a, that's a matter of understanding that Isaac's a picture of Jesus Christ. And he's the promised seed. All right? One is born of flesh and one is born supernaturally. Are you getting the picture yet? You're born of the flesh. Go to John chapter number three. Go to John three real quick. Uh, I was going to start quoting, and I thought, you know, it's just better if you look at it. John chapter 3, look at verse number 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice he says born again. All right? Not born, not born once, right? You've got to be born twice. All right? Nick the even said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. We explained this recently, that water is mentioned in verse 6 as a fleshly birth. All right? And then you, in verse number 6, it says, That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That is you receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, and through the supernatural process of salvation, the Holy Spirit of God regenerating you and giving you new life where there was no life. And because of that, because you received it, you say, what is that? That is when you receive the new birth. And when you receive the new birth, you know what? You're no longer just a child of the devil, John chapter number 8. You have now been adopted. Now you are a child of God. We learn about that in Romans 8. The adoption, we've received the spirit of adoption. And because of that, there's a connection spiritually to Isaac. Isaac being a picture of Jesus Christ. All right, go back to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9. Is this making sense at all? Well, the first birth is fleshly, and so whether you're a Jew or Gentile, the Jews would say, well, we have Abraham and our father. Well, that's not good enough. You need to be born again, all right? The Gentiles would say, we've got religion. Well, that's not good enough. You need to be born again. Yeah, well, I was raised in a Christian home. That, that's not good enough. You need to be born again. Uh, being born in a garage doesn't make you a Ford. Amen. 
uh, or a Chevy or whatever your favorite vehicle is, doesn't matter, all right, or a Tesla for that matter, you know, uh, uh, being born in a, an electric voltage, you know, recycling lab or whatever de- that car is made out of, whatever, however it runs. Uh, you understand what I'm saying is you, you have to be born again. That's a personal choice. And so once that happens, you are a spiritual, you're part of a spiritual nation because it is a spiritual birth. What I want to do is I want to run through some references. Look at John, uh, look at, I'm sorry, verse number seven here. And then look at verse eight. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. You say, what is that? That flesh is connected to Abraham. You see that from the verse prior? Romans 9, 8. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So if you connect children of flesh, that goes back to Abraham. And then he goes on to say this, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Well, in verse 7, the Bible explains itself. Verse 7 says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac's the promised son. And so what you see here, guys, is simply this. Abraham is a picture of the physical nation of Israel. And so what Paul is addressing, he's building up a case in chapters 9 and 10 and 11. And in chapter 9, he's talking about, you know, the, the, the ble- at the beginning of the chapter, the blessings that Israel has being the nation, the chosen people of God. But then he gets down and he goes, okay, but just because they're chosen people of God doesn't mean they, ha- they don't have to be saved. Individually, they still have to be born again if they want to get in on this thing being called the children of God. Do you know what it's like as a Jew to know that you're the chosen people and God gave you the Bible and God gave you the scriptures and God gave you prophecy and God gave you light and some Gentile, some dirty dog comes up to you and says, you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? That rubs them the wrong way. And so Paul is saying, look, I'm one of them. I'm a Jew of, of, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I learned at the feet of Gamaliel. I was a scholar of the law. And I'm telling you, if you want to be a child of God today, you have to come through Christ. It's not just what family or what nation you're born into. You know, if someone says, well, are you saved? And you said, well, I'm, I'm 27 years old. If someone says, well, where were you born? You know, uh, I'm five foot eight. Well, what does that matter? If I, if I say, are you saved? And you say, well, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic. I, my, 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 dad was, my granddad was a Baptist preacher. Well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, if anyone had a claim to automatically getting in, so to speak, it would be the nation of Israel. And that's what Paul is trying to make the case for here is they had the promises and the covenants and and the prophecies and the service of God and the glory and the adoption. And yet, all that said, they still have to come through Christ. All right? Look at John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. You know, whether you're a Jew or Gentile today, if you're going to get there, yesterday me and Emma were doing some chalk art on our sidewalk. And uh, you know what I never want to be? I never want to be the preacher that when the kid comes up to him and says, Dad, can we go play? Uh, I'm too busy in the ministry. We're not going to do that. I have a great, a great famous preacher that his son asked him, can, I, can we go to a baseball game, Dad? Can we go to a baseball game, Dad? Can we go to a baseball game? And for years, you know what he did? He said, no, son, no, son, I'm trying to save America. I lost his son. I'm going to say something that's real profound, and some of you may not even know what to do with it, but the ministry is not God. Amen. And, and so you know what your first priority is? Outside of your fellowship with Jesus Christ, your family. So that's it. I don't know. That just came out of nowhere. Anyways, we're, we're doing chalk art yesterday on the sidewalk. And I said, what do you think, we're, you know, ideas of what we're going to draw? And so we drew, you know, one thing of the house. And we do some strict stick figures of the family. And, and I said, what about like a, 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 a verse? And she goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, great. So we get a, a one-way sign. We paint that one way. And, we, you know, we draw it out. And, you know, I'm the, I, she writes the truth and I write the life. And then she, we, we both write the way together and do the little, the little symbol of one way and the arrow pointing up and all that kind of stuff. You say, what is that? That's how anyone gets in today. That's it. One way. That, that's it. It's through Jesus Christ or nothing. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And look, if you would, at verse number uh, 33. They answered him. Well, go back to verse 32. This is Jesus talking. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Isn't that good? True freedom comes from truth, knowing it and applying it in your life. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. That's a lie. They're in bondage right there and then to Rome. And prior to that, they're in bondage to Babylon. Prior to that, they're in bondage to Egypt, and the story goes so on and so forth. But, you know, pride has a way of sort of pickling your mind and your memory as to how things were before you've met Jesus, doesn't it? And so they said, we, we be Abraham's seed. Notice that was their argument. We're, we're, hey, we're Jews. What are you doing talking to us about all this stuff? And Jesus like, hey, guys, I'm one of you. 
right? He even says salvation is of the Jews, John 4, because it came of them. Jesus came of them. L- look, if you would, at verse number uh, 30, let's see here, 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say to you, whosoever committed a sin is the servant of sin. Do you not see the battle that's going on from Old Testament to New Testament where all they understand is the physical and he's trying to show them the spiritual? It's not that the spiritual wasn't there. It's always been there. What's the first and great commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind. You, you say, what is that? That's a spiritual commandment. It's always been there. But there was a part of that that just didn't make sense until Jesus Christ, the embodiment of truth, showed up to redeem his people Israel. And so there he is talking to his own people, and, and they're talking to him about you know, being in physical bondage. And he goes, hey, but you're in spiritual bondage. You see what's going on? And so there's a battle here between physical seed Versus spiritual seed. Verse uh, 36, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Any free folks in here today? Yeah. Amen. Are you, are you free by Jesus Christ? Man, thank God you are. Look what he says uh, in verse 37. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. They answered, verse 39, and said to him, Abraham is our father. You, you see the constant connection to Abraham? This is why Paul is addressing it the way he is in Romans 9. All right? Because they're going, well, we're Abraham. See, we're Abraham. See, we're Abraham. See, don't forget. We're, you know, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had father. Right? Remember that song when you were a kid? All right? Uh, they're, they're going through that ritual with him. And look what he says in verse 39. They answer and said to him, Abraham's our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. You know what they're doing? They're trying to throw a slam in Jesus' face. Oh, yeah, that virgin born stuff, sure, right. Your mom never was with a man, and that's how you came around. That's what they're doing right there. And uh, look what happens. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, okay, now they're getting spiritual. So he goes, okay, now at least we're on the same page. But let me correct you once more. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Now, l- look down, if you would, at verse number 44. I want you to know that I didn't write that. A Baptist preacher didn't write that. That would be considered hate speech by some people's standards. And the one that loved you enough to die for your soul said that. And he's talking to his own people. He came in his own, John chapter 1, and his own received him not. All right, but notice that, that desire to be connected to Abraham. And that is why Paul is addressing it the way that he is. Look at Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians 4. Hopefully this is making some sense for you. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And Paul does it again uh, over in Galatians 4 where he draws a line between Isaac and Ishmael. Now they're both Abraham's children, but one is the promised one and one is not. And notice this. Think about this, guys. Which one came first? Ishmael came first. And then Isaac came after that. You know, you have a picture of the flesh and then the spirit. The first birth and the second birth. All right? If you don't don't know what I'm talking about, look if you would at verse number uh, 25. For this Agar, that's Hagar, Ishmael's mom, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer it to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, that's New Jerusalem that, that, that you learn about from John in John chapter, or in Revelation chapter number uh, 21. Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry. Look what he says in verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, catch it, are the children of promise. You, what is that? That's a spiritual thing. And so what Paul is doing is he's drawing a correlation between the physical and the spiritual today. It doesn't negate the physical promises that God made to Israel. That's still in play. That's still going to be realized. But what it does do is it says this. If you want to be saved individually. See, guys, get a hold of this. God deals differently with nations and groups than he does with individuals. All right? God can pronounce judgment on a nation, and there can still be righteous people that serve God. Listen, Israel always had a remnant. Elijah goes, I'm the last one. Nobody else is left. It's me by myself. And God goes, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. You say, what is that? That's a remnant. All right, but I want you to understand, there's this thing between the seed of Abraham and then Isaac. All right, the Abraham versus Isaac. Ishmael versus Isaac. And Paul does it in Romans. He does it in Galatians. And he's trying to make the case for the spiritual. Now, I don't have time to go through this, but I'm gonna give you some verses if you wanna write these down. 
Psalms 105, verse 6. You say, what is that? Uh, that's about the, the phrase, if you want uh, verses on the phrase, the seed of Abraham, here are some verses, and every single time they show up, they are positive, all right, in the Old Testament, all right, seed of Abraham is positive in the Old Testament, all right, Psalm 105, verse 6, Psalm 41, verse 8, Psalm 105, verse 6, Psalm 41, verse 8, how about this in Romans 11, 1, that's a positive one too, Paul says, I am of the seed of Abraham, all right, but then look at 2 Corinthians 11. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 22. This is another one of them. I, I didn't have time to go through all, look at all the other ones, but I want you to look at this one. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And look, if you would, at uh, verse number 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. You ever, ever seen kids argue? No, uh uh-huh. uh uh-huh. my, my dad can beat up your dad. Oh, yeah, look at my sword. Yeah, well, mine makes noise. Shh, shh. You know, well, I got, I got, I got, I got some money. I do too. And so Paul's going, look, you guys want to play that game? I can play too. You know, are they, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? Underline it. So am I. But he goes on to explain that, look, that by itself, that does not delineate individual salvation. That does not make you today a spiritual child of God. All right. Uh, so, so again, keep in mind what's going on in Romans chapter 9. Paul is building a case. All right, number 8 in your outline. I want to give you this really quickly, and I'll have you turn to a verse of Scripture as well. Number 8 in your outline, all right, has to do with uh, the uh, firstborn being uh, surpassed by the second. It is a repeated theme throughout the Bible that although the firstborn should be in line to take over, it is often bypassed for the secondborn. All right, so the firstborn is the one that, if you know anything about Jewish culture and how God set it up, he would say, okay, the blessing and the birthright, all that goes to the firstborn, but oftentimes the firstborn, this is number eight in your outline, uh, the firstborn is passed up for the second. All right, it happens with Manasseh and Ephraim. You guys remember that when Joseph is blessing the, the children of Joseph, or Jacob is blessing the children of Joseph? It happens with Cain and Abel, right? Uh, Ishmael and Isaac. How about this? Adam and Jesus. Look at uh, Romans chapter number 5. Romans 5. We, we learned this on the way through, but it's good to review again. Romans 5. Romans chapter number 5. And look, if you would, at verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 15. But not as he offend, or verse 14, I'm sorry. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them, by the way, this is Sunday school. You know what that means? It's study time, amen? So that's why we look at all the verses that we're looking at. I, 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 I have been to, I don't want to be offensive or put down other places or anything like that, but I've been to churches where a, a guy reads one verse of scripture and like, that's it. I come to church hungry. I don't know about you. Like, I want to learn something. If I'm going to get the kids and, man, you know, try to get them cleaned up and get them coned and the teeth brushed and the shoes on it, throw them in the car as they get older and make sure, hey, you're wearing tennis shoes with that dress. What's wrong with you? Put on some other shoes, right? Or whatever may happen. If I'm going to do all that and come to church, I want to get something out of it. I don't know about you, but I do. Romans 5, uh, look what he says here in verse 14. Uh, uh, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam and Moses, even over them that had not sinned, After the similitude of Adam's transgression, notice this, who is the figure of him that was to come. You see that? Adam's a figure. He's a picture of somebody. You say, why? Because Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he took a bite of that fruit. He was going to die for his wife. And Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he died on that cross. He was going to die for his bride. Look at uh, verse number 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one, Adam, to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses under justification. For if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men in condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. You see what do you have? Well, let me show you what you have. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, obviously you learn from that passage that Adam was a figure of Jesus. He was a figure of him that was to come. But I want you to look at the wording that you're going to find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in regards to this same thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 
and verse number 45. Now, let me say this too. I, I, I need to need s- sort of compliment what I just said with the following. If you're here and you're not as familiar with all the books of the Bible and where to find them, let me just encourage you, don't give up. Amen. Keep turning, keep looking, keep reading, keep studying. Eventually, you won't be looking around going, how come they know where it's at? I ha- they've done three verses and I'm still looking for the one like five minutes ago. Y- you won't feel that way if you just stick with it. Uh, have you ever, you know, when you're teaching kids to read, my, we had the privilege of homeschooling our kids, and, and it was really cool just to watch them read for the first time. And it was really interesting with our last child because she struggled more with her eyesight. And so we thought, man, is this kid ever going to read? And she had a lot of issues when she started reading, and now she's reading her Bible in the morning. You go, oh, man, she reads her, yeah, man, when they start reading, look, when they can talk back, they should learn to read the Bible. <laughs> That's my rule of thumb. Listen, if you can make a mess, you can pick it up. If you can talk back, then you can, you can say the right things. And if you can sit there and veg in front of a TV for five hours, you can read your Bible for 10 minutes. All right? So anyways, it, it's neat to see that progression. You will experience that yourself if you stick with it, right? Uh, verse 45, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Who's he talking about? Keep reading verse 47. The first man is of the earth. You know what the Adam means? It means dirt, <laughs> from the ground, all right? You say, why? Because God made them. Ladies, men are just dirt balls. Amen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, you, you happen to be a part of us, so don't forget that, okay? Uh, I, I want to hear an amen there as well, but, but, uh, but, uh, but we're dirt balls. Adam was made of the dust of the ground, right? And so he's of the earth. He's earthy. And as it, look what he says here in verse 47, though. The second man is the Lord from heaven. You see that? Look at uh, verse, uh, oh, uh, verse number 49, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Here, here's what he's saying here, guys. You have the firstborn of God in creation, being Adam, right? The firstborn. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to pass that one up. It's going to take a couple thousand years, but I'm going to send the, the, the one that I really, the, the way Adam should have been is going to come down and show you guys how it's supposed to be done. And so he's the last Adam. So there's this principle in the Bible that where God will bypass, even though by nature, and even by God's own standards, the firstborn gets the blessing. God goes, you know what? I'm going to bypass that firstborn, and I'm going to go to the second. And so what do you have with Ishmael and Isaac? You have the same idea. And so God goes, you know what? I'm showing you something in that. All right? You've got the physical nation of Israel, but they rejected the Messiah. God's not done with them. We're going to see that. But I'm, I'm addressing the church today. And whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you can come in. And that's the case that Paul is making. All right, uh, look in your outline, number nine in your outline. All right, in verse number eight, children of the flesh is a reference to Israel today. Children of the flesh is a reference to Israel today. Children of God is a reference to New Testament believers today. Children of God is a reference to New Testament believers today. All right, in Christ, it is just one body. Look at Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter 3. By the way, if you want a uh, reference verse for that phrase, children of God, you could write Romans 8, 14 through 16 in your notes. But look at Galatians. That's another reason why I give you this outline. If you want to write notes on there, you can do that as you study. I'd encourage you. Some of you may want to do this. Some of you may not. Uh, but uh, I'd encourage you. Maybe take this home, put a you know, three-hole punch in it, put it in a binder somewhere, and, and just use it as an outline to study your Bible. Some, I've, heard people, I, I've had people approach me and say, Pastor, I don't really know where to start studying my Bible. I would encourage you to take your Sunday school notes and look back over that. All right? Galatians 3, look at verse number, uh, verse number 26. Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are all, underline it, the children of God by physical birth, <laughs> by being baptized. No. By keeping the commandments, no. (laughs) By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. That's a spiritual baptism that's spoken of in Romans 6 and 1 Corinthians 12. Nothing to do with water. That is the new birth. All right, John 3. That's what that is. All right. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. There's your transgender. All right. You know, everything the world's trying to go after, you could find in Christ. There's neither male nor female, for you're all... Now, 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 just keep in mind, guys, 
this does not, the, the, the same way that a man and a woman are still physically different and the relationship, the position of husband and wife, yes, is supposed to be different biblically, whether your mom or dad or grandparents or the school system or education or college or society's class or whatever else, or Dr. Phil or whoever else says whatever, the Bible says they are different. All right? They're supposed to be. God made them that way. All right? Not better or worse, different. They complement each other. All right? uh, the same way that is still the case, the nation of Israel is not done. All right? so, so in Christ, there's neither male nor female. Well, I guess that means there's no moms or dads. It's just us. No, there's a mom, there's a dad, there's a way this is supposed to be done physically. Guys, you know how you know that's true? Read Ephesians 5 and 6. It's clear those physical distinctions are still there, but he's saying this, in light of, in context of, being a part of the body of Christ, whatever nation you're from has no bearing at all. Whether you're a man or a woman has no bearing at all. If you are in Christ, it's because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've experienced the new birth, and you are a child of of God. All right, now number 10 in your outline, this is important as well. These statements do not negate Israel's place with the Lord or his promises. It, it, it's not, uh, these statements do not negate Israel's place or promises with the Lord. And we're going to read about that uh, later on in Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 1. All right, uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 real quickly. Let me show you that those physically, physically speaking, the distinctions are, are there, but in Christ we're one. Now, I know today anymore, you know, people say, well, let's not talk about our differences. I, you know what's weird to me? It's just the most hypocritical thing. If you want to really celebrate diversity, you talk about how we're different. And, and let me just tell you, I know some great Puerto Rican jokes. And right now, somebody go, oh, you're getting spiritually constipated. You're going, oh, news media tells me if I laugh at that, I'm a racist. I can tell you some funny ones. And somebody go, oh, I'm Puerto Rican. Take it easy. Okay? All right? My, my whole point is this. There are differences between us, and we should be able to laugh about them. There are jokes that you can tell about men and how they respond to things that are funny compared to how women respond to things. I was telling a story downstairs to a couple of ladies, some of the Sunday school teachers, and, and my wife was there, and she chimes in and starts on her part of it. I said, and that's her version of it. It's a lot more lengthy. There's more detail. The cup tipped like this. The water poured out. And I just said, this happened when we move on. And you said, well, that's funny, guys. That's okay to laugh at that. All right? we, it, we're, we're supposed to acknowledge the differences, but understand that in Christ, one is not more important than the other. All right? um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, look if you would at verse, uh, well, let's just read verse 32. The context of verse 32 is talking about not eating the things sacrificed to idols. You may have the liberty to do it. All right? There may be some things you have liberty to do in Christ, but you shouldn't do them because you care about your brother or sister's conscience. All right? Well, I've got my liberty. Okay, yeah, you do. But how's it going to affect your brother in Christ? Well, that's their business. No, that's your business. You know what you sound like when you say that? You sound like Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? You know what's interesting? My wife was telling me she's reading a note in her Bible. Uh, and I'm going I'm to talk about this. There's a story where the Gibeonites tricked the Israelites. And the note in the Bible says, uh, never trust someone that doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Amen? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Let's go with some husband and wife stuff. We're going to move on. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 32. Give none offense, underline it, neither to the Jews, that's Israel, nor to the Gentiles, that's all the other nations, nor to the church of God. That's a spiritual nation. And if you're a part of that, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. So that is what Paul has been trying to get to in Romans chapter number 9. All right? Now, having said that, I want to talk about something that I think is really critical to get a hold of. Look at your outline, number 11. I can tell you right now, the outline that I gave you, number 12 through 19, we'll use it next week. We're not going to get to it today. Uh, but number 11 is, is critical that you get a hold of this. And I do want to spend some of the last few minutes we have talking about this. All right, I'm going to give you what the answers are so you can fill in the blanks for number 11. Then I'm going to go ahead and explain it, all right? So number 11. There are some that teach due to passages like the one we just read in Romans 9. Where, where Paul says, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, for example. And passages where Jesus himself mentions other sheep, as found in John chapter 10. He mentions the sheep of Israel, and he says, I've got other sheep which are not of this fold. That's the Gentiles who get in. That's us. That the church replaces Israel. 
And this is called replacement theology. And it is not sound doctrine because it ignores the other passages that speak of Israel prophetically as a nation. Let me go through it one more time. All right? There are some that teach due to passages like this one in Romans 9 and passages where Jesus himself mentions other sheep as found in John 10 that the church replaces Israel and this is called replacement theology. And it is not sound doctrine because it ignores the other passages that speak of Israel prophetically as a nation. I'm going to give you some of those passages right now. Let's turn to some of them. If you want to write them down, at least the references in your notes, you are welcome to do that. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number 16. Jeremiah 16. I don't, I'll never forget one time I uh, had somebody in this church that has spent a lot of time on YouTube. I don't think there's anything wrong with listening to good preaching on YouTube. <laughs> Under, let me emphasize good preaching, all right? Uh, but I will tell you, just because somebody has good music and nice graphics and uh, they speak emphatically doesn't mean they're right. Yeah, amen. And so this particular person had been watching this particular preacher whose name shall not be mentioned because I don't want to give them free publicity because they're an idiot, and I say that as graciously as I can. <laughs> Listen, anyone that gets up and, uh, and, 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 and rants and raves uh, about the fact that they were... Uh, uh, they want to get in trouble with the police when they go out door to door knocking. That's not a, that's not a leader. That's a fool. That's a poor example of a leader. Uh, do you know what the? Uh, I won't go there. It, the, the whole the whole thing is this lady was messed up because of what she'd watched online. So I sat down, opened up the Bible. You know what we did? I don't have time to go through all of them. I'm just going to give you a little bit. But I went through about 50 references and I said, "What about this? And what about this? And what about this?" And, and you know what she said? I never read those. I said, have you read your Old Testament? Not really. I said, you know, you may not want to dismiss Israel as a nation when most of your Bible is about them, 39 books. You may want to go back there and learn about that. And you'd be good to learn about it too. Some of you would like to hang out in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and you're like, well, I don't want to hit Numbers, and I don't want to hit Chronicles, and I don't want to hit Kings, and I, it's just boring stuff. It's not as boring as you might think. And there's some great stuff in there, and you'll learn more about God's entire plan for the ages. Look at Jeremiah 16, look at verse number 14. Uh, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them, and I will bring them, underline it, again into, the land, into their land that I gave unto their fathers. You want to see some interesting guys? Look at verse 16. Check this out. Talk about some prophecy. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. Do you remember what he calls the disciples? Now, if you reject the fishers, you know what you got to deal with? The hunters. So you know what happens? Treblinka, Auschwitz, right? Uh, you know what you've got? You've got, you've got the, the, the Holocaust from World War II. And I'll tell you what, what's going to come in the tribulation is going to make that look like a picnic. All right? It's going to wipe them out where there's just a, just a very small remnant of them left when God shows back up to establish his kingdom. But let me, let me point out to you guys, this has not happened yet. So either you throw out that God is a liar or you say, well, it's still coming. Does that make sense? All right, look at Ezekiel chapter number 36. By the way, let me remind you one more time, you're not promised a physical land. All right, you're promised spiritual blessings because you are a spiritual priesthood in a spiritual nation that offers up spiritual sacrifices, or at least you ought to, unto God. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, look if you would at verse number 24. Now, do you understand the average church today, this would be like so boring and so dry and I have no interest whatsoever and tell me, tell me how to, you know, cope with my boss or tell me how to, love myself, or tell me how to, you know what, you know, people don't understand, the, the Bible is bigger than just you, right. and God lets us in on it, thank God for that, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's, it's for you, but it's not to you or about you, we learned that Wednesday night, look at Ezekiel 36, and look at verse 24, for I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land, that hasn't happened yet, you say, well, they're in their own land. Well, not completely. Look at verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, you shall be clean. Listen, they were scattered back in the Old Testament and brought back after Babylon. They were scattered in the diaspora back in 1948. 
And here, here's how you know this could not be 1948. Look what he says in verse 25. Sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. Guys, when Jesus shows, during the great tribulation, he calls Jerusalem the capital where Jesus will reign the entire world. The world capital will not be Moscow, New York, Tokyo, London. It'll be Jerusalem where Jesus will reign on the earth, over all the earth. You know what he says about Jerusalem during the great tribulation? He calls it spiritually Sodom and Egypt, not good places. So it can't be until at least after Revelation 11. Does that make sense? Where he sprinkles them and cleans them and makes everything right with them. That is the restoration of the nation of Israel. Look at uh, Zechariah chapter number 10. And I'm going to give you, I'll read this one last one. And I'll just give you the rest of the references. We don't have time to read them all. Zechariah chapter number 10. Remember Captain America? I can do this all day. Well, we could do this all day. All right. Zechariah chapter number 10. Look, if you would, at verse, uh, oh, let's see here. Verse number nine. Verse number nine. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me. Who? Israel. You learned that from reading the earlier part in the, in, the, in the chapter, actually in the chapter prior. All right. Uh, I will sow them among the people. He scatters them all over the world. They shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. I'll bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I'll bring them in the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. You say, why? Because God is going to bless them and multiply them as the stars of heaven like he promised him in Genesis chapter number 12. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. All right. Uh, let me give you the rest of the references. And we'll wrap it up. Amos chapter, if you want them, if you want them. Amos chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. Amos 9, 13 through 15. Amos is not just a cookie brand. It's a book in the Bible. Famous Amos. Amos 9, 13 through 15. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. Isaiah 2, 2 through 3. Uh, Isaiah 40, verses 10 through 11. Isaiah 40, 10 through 11. Isaiah 49, 8 through 26. Isaiah 49, 8 through 26. Isaiah 60, 9 through 18. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 9 through 18. All right. We will learn... A little bit more about uh, some things. We're going to get into some other stuff next week about uh, God's purposes and how God works and in c- election and I- is it conditional, is it unconditional, uh, all that kind of stuff. Let's all stand. We'll be dismissing a word of prayer for Sunday school. We'll take a break.